you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. I want to read in your hearing verses uh, 1 through 6. Ushers, there are additional seats down front here. Those. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, uh, beginning at verse 1, the word of the Lord reads as follows. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone, and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said, come see the place where he lay. Amen. And today, church, I want to preach from the thought, never say never. Is that all right? Never say never. Never. From 1901 to 1904, Joe Walcott was the welterweight champion of the world in boxing. Walcott had a small stature, great stamina, and a solid punch. And throughout his career, he weighed between 138 pounds and 145 pounds and has been regarded by many historians of the sport as one of the greatest pound-for-pound -pound fighters of all time. And what made Walcott stand out, church, is that after defeating everyone in his weight class, he sought out fights with boxers in heavier weight classes. That's right. After beating all of the welterweights, Walcott decided that I'll try to fight fighters who are bigger and in heavier weight classes. In 1900, he issued challenges to Tom Sharkey, Gus Rulin, and even champion Jim Jeffries, but none of them were willing to fight Walcott. His brawn, his build, and his brains in the ring were too much for these foes to handle. These bigger and heavier fighters, some as much as 40 times heavier than Walcott, uh, did not dare to ring, get in the ring with him because when they did, they discovered that they had met their match. Walcott toppled so many heavyweights that he earned the name Giant Killer. And asked in an interview once how it was that he was able to defeat so many heavyweights and men who were taller and broader and bigger than he was, Walcott replied, it's easy, that the bigger they are, the harder they fall. That's right, Walcott is the man who's known for coining that expression. He was the embodiment of what it meant to face any foe, any obstacle, any circumstance with the conviction that regardless of how big it was, it could be defeated. That regardless of how big and how great and how imposing one's adversary is, it can fall and it can be overcome. And I discovered, church, that it's a truth that applies to boxers, but it also applies applies to life as well that the bigger the obstacle is the greater the propensity it is to be torn down and as believers we know that to be true I, I would like to believe that it was not Walcott but David of the Bible who was the first one who said the bigger they are the harder they fall when he defeated Goliath you know, situations that seem formidable, unsurmountable from man's perspective are able to be overcome by the power of God. Regardless of what it is, regardless of how it appears, challenges like boxers can come down the bigger they are. And that's what comes to my mind, church, when I read about the events of the first Easter morning. 
the Friday that Jesus died was probably the worst day in the lives of the family, friends, and followers of Jesus Christ. After giving up everything to follow this no-named Jewish carpenter from a town called Nazareth, they witnessed the unthinkable. They, they witnessed the suffering of their Messiah and the shame they had endured from the crowds who persecuted them. Since you all know the story, I'll spare you the gruesome details of what happened on that day. But when it was all over, the day that included pain and punishment and persecution concluded at a tomb. That tomb, a church, was the last site for these faithful followers of Jesus. And sitting outside of that tomb, according to Luke's account, were Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And at that moment, church, sitting outside of that tomb, all hope is gone. Optimism has been extinguished and the flame of faith has burned out. And I suspect that thoughts like we made a mistake, what are we to do now, must have consumed and taken over their minds. And that's what I discovered is what life is like when you are facing a tomb. A tombs in this text are nothing but a metaphor for what happens in life when it seems as if things are over. Tombs are repositories for that which is dead. Tombs are the embodiment of that which is painful. Tombs are places of finality and resignation. Tombs are places where hopes are buried and where dreams go to die. When life leads you outside of your tomb, regardless of what tomb it is, whether it's a financial tomb, a relationship tomb, a tomb of family drama and problems, a spiritual or an emotional tomb, a word begins to emerge in your vocabulary that signals the sense of finality that the moment suggests. When, when you reach a tomb in your life, a word begins to enter your vocabulary that tombs begin to suggest and that word is never we say things like this is never going to turn around I am never going to be able to get through this we are never going to be able to get over or to get beyond this tombs tempt us to wave the white flag of life and to conclude that it's all over and on this Easter Sunday morning there is perhaps somebody in the church or listening to me right now who knows what it's like to find yourself at life's tomb perhaps some of you know what it's like to find, be at a tomb on your job when you are dealing with so many uh, enemies uh, on your jobs that you wake up in the morning uh, and you don't even want to go to work anymore somebody else knows what it's like to deal with a tomb in your relationship you in a relationship with somebody you don't even want to look at them talk to them lay next to them just the sound of them eating begins to make your stomach churn because you have gotten to a tomb some of y'all know what it's like to get at a tomb and whenever you get to a tomb you feel like giving up but the reason we can rejoice during this season of resurrection is, is to remind us, church, that tombs for the child of God are two-sided. That, that's right. Tombs for the Christian have two sides. Uh, tombs are closed on one end, but they're open on the other end. Tombs are shut in in one sense, but they are accessible in another sense. And as Christians, we can rejoice about that because uh, between the pain of Good Friday and the triumph of Sunday morning, uh, God some way, somehow converted what was supposed to be a place of tri terror into a place of joy. Some way, somehow, uh, between Friday and Sunday morning, uh, God was able to convert a place of pain into a place of jubilee. The tomb in this text provides uh, a teachable moment for anyone who has or will ever face 
a dark, dismal, uh, and disappointing period of your life. Three days uh, after Jesus died, God converted a place that was marked for death and made it into a site of deliverance. Three days, uh, somebody say three days, uh, uh, three days after Jesus died, uh, God took a place of hurt and made it into a hospital of hope. Three days, somebody say three days, uh, three days after Jesus was put in a tomb, God uh, made a place of bondage uh, and turned it into a place of breakthrough. Uh, tombs in life church don't have to be final. Uh, tombs in life don't have to have uh, the final word. Uh, the reason we can rejoice today uh, is because we realize uh, that tombs can be places of revival uh, and reversal and restoration. Uh, and I'm going to tell you how I know that's true. Uh, because you wouldn't be here today uh, if God was not able uh, to convert your tomb uh, into a uh, a testimony have I got a witness here in the text things were happening in that tomb life and liberty were given in that tomb and the good news on Easter resurrection Sunday is the same thing that God did then is the same thing that God can do now can you do me a favor and look at your neighbor and say neighbor never say never that was the wrong neighbor. Look at the one on the other side and say, neighbor, regardless of what you're going through, uh, never say never. Now, before I go any further, somebody ought to shout and thank God right now. But right there, because just the recognition that your, that your tomb is not the signal that it's over ought to give you God, help you give God praise. So my assignment now is to, is to help you to understand what's required in order to convert your tomb into a site of reversal. Y'all hear my, my responsibility and my assignment today is to help you understand what needs to happen in order to convert your tomb into a place of revival. I'm glad. Uh, first thing I want to tell you is that when things are at their most difficult, the first thing you got to do is show up despite your tomb. Uh, verse 1 says that very early in the morning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary showed up at the tomb. Uh, that's what converted this place of sadness into a place of celebration. They showed up. After all of the trauma they had experienced, after all of the pain that they had endured, verse 1 says they had the presence of mind to show up. See, the bringing of spices to anoint the body of Jesus was a required part of Jewish worship. And so in the face of their sadness and sorrow they showed up to worship God anyhow despite what they were experiencing and were going through they kept coming they kept pushing and pressing their way to worship God anyhow and that act right there set in motion a series of events that led to the reason that you and I are still are here right now think about it you are here at 1020 on a Sunday morning because two sisters over 2,000 years ago had the presence of mind to be going through a trial and still showing up at their tomb. Despite what they had seen, they had enough faith in God to show up anyhow. They could have given up like everybody else. That's what a lot of other people do when things go wrong in their lives. They go home, they back away. But I stop by to tell somebody that it's precisely at the point of your trouble when you need to show up. These followers show us that it's precisely at the time of your greatest need that you need to keep on praying. You need to keep on praising and you need to be present with the Lord. And as difficult as that Friday was, they continued to worship God. I like these sisters because they show us that every now and then there is a blessing in the pressing. Can you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, there's a blessing in the pressing? Uh, Woody Allen once said that 80% of success is just showing up. Are y'all here? 
uh, Gary, Gary Kildall found that out. Gary Kildall was, was a pioneer in the computer industry in the 1970s. Uh, Kildall invented the first operating system for microcomputers. That's right. Gary Kildall was a pioneer of software computing, a pioneer of the computer industry. And so in the summer of 1980, as one of the top software pioneers of the time, IBM invited Gary Kildall to a meeting to propose building an operating system for his upcoming microcomputer. I need y'all to get this. In the 1970s, Gary Kildall was a pioneer of the computer industry. He was the sought-out name in software. And so in the summer of 1980, IBM invited Gary Kildall to a meeting so that he could help them figure out a way to build an operating system for its upcoming microcomputer. But Gary Kildall didn't show up to the meeting. He blew off the meeting and it led IBM to call a little known programmer by the name of Bill Gates and Microsoft became the industry standard for the PC and it all happened because Gary Kildall didn't show up to the meeting. Gary Kildall rather than Bill Gates might have been the richest man in the world right now but he missed out on his blessing because he didn't show up. Have I got a witness here? I stopped by to tell you that there is a miracle with your name on it but you cannot allow life's trials, the problems in your family, the issues in your finances, the troubles in your health keep you at home. You gotta show up when you're going through despite what you see you gotta find a way to show up and worship God because when you show up you will put yourself in a position to witness a miracle from God what if what if these sisters had stayed home uh, what if they had joined another religion? What if, what if they had gone back to a life of sin? We wouldn't be here today. But, Lord have mercy, they held on to their faith in God and they showed up at the tomb anyhow. And that's what I want to tell somebody here on an Easter Sunday morning. Sometimes, Lord have mercy, there can be a breakthrough in you just simply pressing your way. See, the mere fact that they showed up, that they were in a place at all was good enough for God to move in their lives. Can I tell you something? I said, can I tell you something? You stop worrying about how it's going to work out. You stop wrestling with when is the bill going to get paid. You stop trying to figure out how the ends are going to be met. And you just show up. Have I got a witness here? See, the enemy wants you to look at the facts and the devil wants you to stay home. But when you refuse to allow what you see to, to control your actions, you'll get into the presence of the Lord. Mark tells us, Mark tells us in Mark 16, 3, he says that he helps us to understand what was going on in their minds. It says that they asked who? is going to roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb. What were they were doing? They were looking at they, what they saw, Lord have mercy, and made conclusions about what was possible based on what they saw. Have I got a witness here? But I stop by to tell you, don't ever allow what you see cause you to conclude what cannot be done. I feel like preaching. Don't you ever allow what is immediately in front of you uh, cause you to lose hope uh, about what's up ahead of you uh, I can just hear them saying uh, to themselves uh, we don't know how uh, it's gonna happen uh, but we gonna go to the tomb anyhow uh, I don't know when uh, and I don't know how uh, but I'm gonna show up anyway uh, and that's what I want you to do uh, when you look at your situation uh, you ought to be able to say to yourself uh, I don't know how uh, but I know who uh, I don't know when uh, but I know who. I don't know where, but I know who. I don't know how he's going to work it out, but I know who's going to work it out. I don't know how he's going to fix it, but I know who's going to fix it. I don't know how he's going to pay that bill, but I know who's going to pay the bill. I don't know how my marriage is going to work out, but I know who is going. 
They said we might be broke, but we're going to show up. We might be busted, but we're going to show up. Come on, slap high five with three people and say, neighbor, whatever you're going through, you got to show up anyhow. See, throwing in the towel when you're facing a tomb might be tempting, but you can't let the tomb, Lord have mercy, cause you to conclude that it's over. I feel like preaching. You can learn a lot about people based upon how they handle life's tombs. You can learn a lot about a Christian based on how they handle difficult days. Have I got a witness here? I discovered that it's easy to praise God. Lord have mercy when everything's going well. It's easy to praise God when you got money in your pocket. When your 401k is going up every quarter. Uh, when you got a ring on your finger and a boo in your bed. But it's another thing to praise God when you're broke. When you got more month at the end of your money. Have I got a witness here? Is there anybody here today who can testify? I'll praise him whether I got money or whether I don't. I'll thank him. Lord have mercy. Whether I got cash, whether I got cars, or where I got clothes. Have I got a witness here? I'm going to come to church if Ray Ray calls me or if Keisha, Lord have mercy, isn't where to be found. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, never say never. Have I got a witness here? But I hear what you're saying. You're saying, preacher, why should I show up? A preacher, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't understand the totality of my situation. You don't know what's going on on my job. You don't know what's going on in my family. Have I got a witness here? And I want to tell you the reason you ought to show up is because what you're connected to is greater than what you're going through. I think I said something. See, the reason you ought to praise God and the reason you ought to keep on praising is because the God that you serve is greater than the situation situation that you're in is there anybody here today who can testify that the God that I serve is greater than divorce he's greater than cancer he's greater than the layoff so rather than telling God how big your problem is you start speaking to your problem and start telling your problem how big your God is is there anybody here who can say God tell your neighbor that's why I thank him tell your other neighbor that's why I praise him Lord have mercy cause what I'm connected to is greater than what I'm going through they had seen some of the most dis, uh, uh, difficult days, but they showed up at the tomb. Y'all sit down, I'm just on my first point. So the first thing. <laughs> if you wanna turn your tomb into a place of reversal, you gotta show up. So many people go through trials and troubles. They start questioning God. They start staying home not coming to church but when you're going through trouble that's when you need to show up and here's why look what happened according to the text the bible says that when they showed up god showed up <laughs> uh, when they showed up for worship god showed out uh, see, suddenly the Bible says uh, there was a great earthquake where they were, according to verse 2. Lord have mercy. And so in response to their demonstration of faith, the Bible says uh, that God started moving on their behalf. And I discovered that's what God does. When God shows up, I want you to notice, according to the text, what he does. When God shows up, he starts removing things that are hindrances 
in our life. Come on, Bible readers. First thing, first thing the text says is that God removed the stone that stood between them and what God wanted to show them. That's right. When God showed up, he started moving obstacles and barriers and impediments out of their way. I want to ask somebody here today, what is your stone? What is the situation, the obstacle or the impediment that is preventing you from hearing and seeing what God is trying to do? When God shows up, he'll remove some stones out of your life. And there are some witnesses here who can testify that when I showed up, Lord have mercy, God just showed out in my life. God, God removed a stone, but the Bible says he also removed a soldier. Uh, Lord have mercy. The Bible says that the ground shook according to verse 4. And it says that there was a guard who was positioned outside of the stone to deter and to hinder them, Lord have mercy, from getting what God wanted them to get. I need y'all to get this. Uh, Lord have mercy. Outside of the stone, there was an individual. There was an adversary. Y'all not here. There was an opponent that was positioned outside of the stone to keep them from getting the blessing that God had for them. Lord have mercy. When they showed up, God showed out by removing the stone. But he also removed the soldier. And I stopped by to tell you that whenever there's a shaking in the foundation of your life, you better get ready because it means that God is about to move some stuff and God's about to move some people is there anybody here today who's ever had some haters Lord have mercy people who saw what God was about to do and they start saying mm, she thinks she all that uh, he think he all that because he got a new car no I don't think I'm all that you think I think I'm all that have I got a witness here but is there anybody here who knows that God would take your haters and use them as elevators for your next level. Have I got a witness here? He'll remove your stones, but he'll remove your soldiers. You got to be careful because I believe that God is shaking and moving some stuff in your life right now. Yes, it's Easter Sunday morning and God is about to bring an earthquake. Lord have mercy. And when things start shaking, that's not the time to despair that's the time to start getting ready because the God that we serve is the kind of God that'll move use an earthquake to start moving have I got a witness here in Exodus 19 18 there was an earthquake just before God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai in the first Kings 19 11 God called an earthquake when he spoke to Elijah on Mount Horeb in Matthew 26 751 it was an earthquake at the death of Jesus that caused the veil of the temple to be torn in two you better watch out whenever the ground starts shaking because it means that God is about to move some stones and God is about to move some soldiers is there anybody here today who can shout and give God praise because you just feel God about to move in your life come on look at your neighbor and say neighbor I don't know about you but God's about to move in my life and whenever I move I feel God moving just like that whenever I pray I feel God's power just like that come on look at your neighbor and say neighbor when you move God will move just like that when you worship he'll show up just like that when you keep fasting he'll make a way just like that is there anybody here who can thank God for what happens at your church uh, tell your neighbor never say never never say never show up show up somebody's here on Easter resurrection Sunday morning you are about to throw in the towel on life on God and everything else and you here for a reason and because you showed up watch God show out when you leave church today you ain't gonna be depressed anymore you're not gonna be fearful anymore
When God showed up according to the text, the Bible says in verses 5 and 6 that God gave them some good news about their situation. <laughs> when they showed up and God showed out, <laughs> the Bible says that God gave them some good news about this situation. It, it was a word that they had not anticipated. It was a word that they had not expected which suggests that after you show up and God shows out, you got to listen up. Tell your neighbor, listen up, listen up. God said three things that stand out to me in this text. First of all, he said in verse 5, he told them, do not be afraid. In the 8th clause of verse 6, he says, he is not here, he is risen. And in the latter clause of verse 6, he says, come and see the place. Lord have mercy. Mm, I feel like preaching. Uh, this first word, this first word, do not be afraid, is a word of inspiration. Do, do not fear, do not be afraid, was designed to provide encouragement. That despite how things appear, they did not have to fear or be afraid. The second word, after giving them a word of inspiration, God gives them a word of revelation. Uh, God says, he is not here. And it was designed to let them know that the problem you thought you had Lord have mercy you don't have it no more have I got a witness here see the situation that they thought was dead the angel said it ain't here no more it is designed to let you know that what you thought you were dealing with is gone honey have I got a witness here is there anybody here today who can thank God for that revelation that what I was dealing with uh, God says it's gone. Uh, Y'all not here. God gave them a word of inspiration. He gave them a word of revelation. But lastly, he gave them a word of confirmation. Can the church shout confirmation? Yeah. Here's what God knew. Uh, God knew that they were going to go back to work the next day. And tell people <laughs> he's not dead. God knew that they would get on the phone, get on Twitter, and tell everybody. <laughs> Jesus is not dead. He's alive. And God knew that when they told other people that, that other people would say, prove it. <laughs> uh, God knew that when, when they told people uh, what they had gone through, other people would not believe them. And so God said, you know what I want you to do? Before you leave here, I want you to see the place where they laid the body. Are y'all here today? Uh, God did not want them to leave without experiencing uh, for themselves. God didn't want them to tell people about what happened based upon secondhand information. No. God didn't want them to talk about the resurrection without having experienced the resurrection for themselves. It's sort of like people who talk about church, who talk about Jesus, but don't know Jesus for themselves. Y'all don't look at me with that that tone of voice. Uh, see, it would have done them no good to come to the tomb and not experience the power, Lord have mercy, of the resurrection for themselves. It's like people who come to church just to be coming to church. It's like people who come to worship, Lord have mercy, not to see God, but to be seen. And when they tell people what happened, all they can talk about is all of the people, all of the crowds, and the parking but when you show up have an encounter for yourself you don't care about people lord have mercy you don't care about the sisters lord have mercy you came to get an experience for yourself and see at a certain point you can't keep coming to church because of your grandmama's testimony at a certain point you got to get your own bump your neighbor say neighbor you got to get your own because mama may have and Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own. I'm going to get out of your way, but I just want to encourage somebody and to let you know that no matter the trial, no matter the situation, never 
say never I don't care what it is don't you ever give up because God has a word for you I feel my help coming it is a word of hope a word of life and a word of joy is there anybody here today who can thank God that regardless of what you're going through that God has a word for you it's a word of victory a word that proclaims that for every valley there is a mountaintop that for every Friday if you can just hold on to Sunday morning you get up in your life it's a word that says a weeping may endure for a night but joy is coming in the morning it's a word that says I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging for bread is there anybody here who can thank God for the word the word kept you the word saved you the word healed you that there's not a weapon that's formed against you that shall prosper it might get formed but it ain't gonna work is there anybody here who can shake your hand at the devil and say devil it ain't gonna work the depression the fear the divorce it ain't gonna work won't he do it I said won't he do it won't he fight your battle? Won't he be a bridge over troubled water? Shout yeah, yeah, shout yeah. When praises go up, blessings come down. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? Won't he be a bridge over troubled water? Yeah, 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 yeah. should have been dead but I thank God that I'm still here should have been out of my mind but I thank God that I'm still here 